So, Sylvia, thank you for finding time to talk today. I'm really happy to be here with you. <laughs> um, and um, a very interesting topic to talk about, which is what COVID-19 uh, means for the development of ESG integration generally. What are your thoughts on that? Well, firstly, um, obviously, we're in very challenging times. And this pandemic, I think, emphasises for me, uh, in particular, and hopefully, I think at large people would agree, the global um, I suppose, integration of not only economies, countries, but real people and also uh, corporate sort of governance um, across when you've got companies that are situated in different countries and supply chains um, that actually need to be fluid and suddenly are disrupted. Um, and I believe sincerely now, even more so, um, resolute in my belief that that move towards ESG which is touching on environmental factors, material risks caused by env environmental factors, material risks in societal impact, and also in terms of corporate governance, are even more important to actually not only ensure that one fully comprehends, embraces, understands, but research and investigates and ensures that from both the business as well as um, a personal perspective, one is quite well equipped to be able to deal with these um, these types of risks, and, and unfortunately, COVID nineteen for me is a real um, ex expression, almost if I can put it that way, of a material risk that was totally. Um, I think it's totally taken the global world by surprise, definitely governments by surprise, um, and also social structures um, and infrastructure by surprise. Um, and, and these are types of things that typically maybe you know, one couldn't have foreseen, given that it was over 100 years I suppose, since we had the Spanish flu, that actually, I suppose, is the most relevant and most, I suppose, similar sort of um, epidemic or pandemic that, that has affected businesses then and, and, and now and people. Um, but because it was so long ago, I think in terms of corporate um, knowledge, corporate tools, corporate um, activity, in ensuring that one, as I say, is robustly positioned to be able to absorb that type of shock um, is, is, is actually glaringly obvious now for investors, institutional investors, who even in this time, we still, even as, you know, to the individual, we are all investors at the end of the day, when, you know, even in our day jobs, because we have to think about the future. Um, and, you know, what we do as investment professionals, as you know, well, it's all about the net present value of future value creation um, that we, we hope um, to, to attain or to achieve, uh, which is evidence in pension funds or insurance company portfolios and then the rest. So I do think that what I think is interesting um, further to that is that Morningstar very recently published uh, first quarter performance tables. And it's interesting to see that there is already starting to be um, a clear uh, difference in performance for companies that have been very vocal um, in their, uh, I suppose, um, in their will and their need to be sustainable to those that haven't been as explicit. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, you know, the old adage, you know, put your money where your mouth is. And sometimes when you express something, and as we know in the city, sort of, you know, your word should be your bond. When you actually sort of vocalise sometimes that, that narrative, it actually helps in the formation of, co you know, company culture. And, and you're more sort of, um, I think, likely, hopefully, to adhere because you know you'll be pulled up if you, if you are falling short. So I think that sort of trend, as it were, that, that looked as if, you know, it was already, it, I felt very much, and especially with the work we've been doing with the CFA, um, with the actual qualification and development of a formal certificate, it, we could tell from all the panel members, which really are representative across the spectrum of our industry, in terms of stakeholders, both on the buy side, sell side, and those who actually do the allocation as well, that that was something that was being embraced and something that people were taking rather seriously. And I just feel that that trend is going to be accelerated because those that had already started, I think actually better positioned to assess 
where they are now, what the impact has been, and where they need to be moving um, towards uh, going forward. And if you're not prepared, um, hopefully, you know, the CFA material would have helped, I think, somewhat with that. Now's the time to really try and see sort of where you can fill in the knowledge gaps and get yourself in a position to really um, come, out, come out of this um, in a better place and really, you know, I suppose position your resources to be able to build something that is sustainable, that can sustain this type of environment, you know, with the yeah. pandemic. We had, we had a bit on sort of um, the global nature of um, corporate activity and supply chains and supply chain risk. And we had a certain amount on sort of healthcare um, already in the syllabus. Do you think that as a consequence of this, um, obviously we have version two almost finished, but version three, what would you, what do you think we might be adding in version three as a consequence of COVID-19? Uh I think you know, version two, I'm quite excited about, actually, because we did actually spend a bit more time um, on global trends, not necessarily the pandemic, but of course, has taken everyone, as I said, by, you know, not surprise, actually, shock. Um, but certainly in terms of the interactions and the linkages between um, various uh, countries and regions, um, we try to test sort of our models and our thesis to see what would happen, you know, in the what if scenarios. And I think what is really and, and hopefully um, will be appreciated by those who do decide to take that particular qualification, that there we, we actually use a number of case studies, which today I don't want to mention them, but they are very topical in the press, both from governance and societal. Um, perspective. So I think that would be very useful for candidates who have already embarked on that journey um, to, to see that. Um, in terms of expanding, um, perhaps um, citing, I know I shouldn't really be sort of name checking all of these um, firms, but True Labs have come up actually as well with some interesting data. And interestingly, now more so than ever, where there are more data points coming up ESG, especially on societal level, which weren't there before. And one of the real, I suppose, drawbacks in terms of ESG that people who have been a bit more resistant to adopting is the symmetry in information and flow. And I think that this crisis actually is, again, acting as a tailwind, as a spur to generate even more information to be able to perfect those models, I think, um, going forward. So um, that's what probably we would be doing in maybe in version three is ensuring that we um, pull as much of that new data as possible and, and, and to keep obviously, as, as we like to do as a society overall, not just within ESG, to be um, at the forefront of, of what's actually going on. I mean, this is a, a, an exam that was developed by practitioners for practitioners. So it's real, it's fast moving. And we have to ensure that 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 material reflects that, and that's what we're doing. 